Yeah, so I think that came through okay. Okay, um, yeah, so just by way of introduction, what I'll do quickly is to talk about the film which we've worked behind, the Eating Our Way to Extinction film, and a few an update on what's happening there. I'll talk about um, the, the work on planetary boundaries and how um, our, our food systems contribute to uh, the environment. And then I'll talk about what the title is, the, uh, the Breaking News, uh, which is uh, a paper that actually hasn't come out of peer review yet, but uh, I think you'll find that very interesting. But uh, so I'll launch into now, eating our way to extinction. It's, uh, it's had about 10 million views. It's now free on YouTube. Um, the, um, the, the, the documentary has been, the, the voiceover it was done by, beautifully by Kate Winslet in English. It's now been done in 18 different languages and released in different countries with celebrities also doing the voiceover in those languages. So um, some of them, uh, you know, uh, red carpet events. Um, it's also been given quite a lot of celebrity endorsements. Um, uh, and and that, that's a big part of it. It's received 12 awards so far. And um, it, the, the companion, the, the, the information that goes with the documentary is a website containing uh, lots of ideas, uh, some of the science, and also cookbooks, kids, kids' cookbooks, and a science book that backs it up. And we've now edited the uh, documentary down to a 36-minute summary version, and that also is available free on YouTube. So that's the update on eating our way to extinction. What I want to talk about now is um, how food systems impact the world and how we can actually reverse the damage that we've done to the environment through food. So before I do that, I want to introduce my background. Now, I worked for government for decades um, mapping deforestation. Okay. Um, my state, Queensland, uh, is a pretty big chunk of the, the northeast section of Australia. There's uh, a map of Texas within Queensland. Queensland's about 2.5 times bigger than Texas, so it's a pretty big uh, home patch. We use satellite data and a lot of field work uh, to monitor the tree clearing, the deforestation. And over that time, over the 30 years of satellite monitoring, we, uh, we mapped 2,500 acres of trees being cut down per day. And 93% of that was for grass-fed industries. And most of it was virgin forest. There's some re-clearing, um, but... but uh, Two and a half thousand acres per day. So that's the equivalent of about uh, two suburbs, two new suburbs that you might be aghast uh, to see urban sprawl taking out forest. Well, that's two suburbs per day. That's just my corner of the world, 4% of the world's deforestation. And this is a, is a video that I've thrown these things together, but it starts off in Australia then goes to other countries. This method of, of tree clearing um, has been invented and perfected in Australia. You get two of the biggest bulldozers you can find, uh, 50 to 100 ton dozers, uh, D9, D11 dozers, and you string a chain between them. Now, one link of the chain is too big to lift. So this is massive industrial scale tree clearing, and it, it's so effective that it's now used globally. But um, they, they uh, these, ch these, dozers the, the the noise of this is just a, a stunning two of the biggest dozers you can imagine going flat out dragging this chain which is clanking the trees are crashing and thumping and splitting and 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 thumping on the ground the the wildlife is going mad the birds the shriek just goes straight through you but uh for those trees here spike on the front of these dozer for these trees that are that are, that are too big to literally rip out of the ground, they use that spike to push them over. 
Um, and this is uh, this is in in um, uh, in a, in the in the United States. So this is this is globally um, what happens. This this comes from uh, Brazil. This is the Cerrado in Brazil, subtropical uh, forest, not the big rainforest, and they're, they're using the same methods. So this is a very effective uh, method of, of, of clearing. This is one of the early shots. This is back in the 1950s when this method was first perfected in Australia. They used these uh, tractor uh, tractor crawlers and they had a big weight in the middle to lift the chain off the ground so that it had more push uh, when you when the, uh, when it hit the trees and it literally ripped the trees out of the ground. Then you push together the the trees and you burn them. It, it, none of this. That's a drip torch, by the way. Um, now they use these drip torches from helicopter or, or quad bike. But um, uh, these fires after deforestation are just relentless. Uh, a lot of airports have been closed in in Southeast Asia due to these deforestation fires. And then they they stick rake. They take away all of the the remains of the the forest, and they burn again and they burn again. Now these are maps. This is this is very interesting. Most people don't see this because they we live in cities where you don't see the burning. But these red spots, we had enough of that. So that brings us on to the first uh, of the planetary boundaries, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the the message with with uh, deforestation is this logging alone does not kill a forest even clear felling getting rid of every tree and pulling them out and even burning it um, and leave once is not enough to kill a forest the forest will regrow repeated burning is required to kill a forest and uh, as we saw the 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 ripping the trees out of the ground, the stumps have got to be ripped out, the stick raked, the, the, the trunks have got to be pushed together and burned again. So logging does not kill forest, repeated burning kills forest. Oh, and going back there, this is a map of north and south of the equator, a 10-day, one 10-day composite of fires all around the world. And you can see that uh, Africa is burning, South America is burning. So agriculture, just shift this a bit. We now know that agriculture causes between 88 and 99% of deforestation. This is uh, from recent years, and most of the clearing has been, or deforestation has been in uh, the tropics. And uh, we, we know that now, for we've had, we've got about four or five decades of satellite data, and uh, we, can, we can work it out. Uh, very carefully. But 96% um, of the world's deforestation is happening in the tropics now, in the rainforests and in the subtropics. And 88 to 90, 99% of that is caused by agriculture. It might click ahead. Oh, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> something something went strange there. So South America has been particularly well studied and they found that 84% of the deforestation, not only in Brazil, but surrounding countries, it's for cattle grazing and for animal feed crops. So um, if, if you wanted to put your finger on what causes deforestation, there it is. When... We, when we deforest, when we take away the forest, burn again and again and then clear it and cultivate the ground, the habitat is gone, basically. So what happens to the wildlife that was on that habitat? Well, to, to wildlife, their patch is everything. That's why they're territorial, because their territory, their, their, their ecosystem is their life support, their food. So if you take that away, they can't just move to the adjoining patch of forest or, or grassland or whatever, savannah. They can't just move because there are other wildlife who live there. So you take away the, the ecosystem that supports their life and they die. 
Some of the birds may survive by eating some of the crops, but basically the wildlife goes. As soon as you take the habitat, the wildlife goes. And that's exactly how we're causing the sixth great extinction because we have so trashed our planet, we've so destroyed the, the, um, the, the, the natural ecosystems on the planet that we've, we've got rid of the, the wildlife. We'll get to that in a minute. So mo many of you have heard that if we all consume like North Americans, we would need five planets to sustain that consumption. And globally, overall, we need 1.7 planets to, su to support global consumption. So what does that mean exactly? Is it, is it iPhones? Is it, is it uh, caviar? You know, what is the, what's causing the problem now? Well, we know, well, let's define that exactly. And the, the, there's been an enormous amount of work done on planetary boundaries. What, what this is, is defining the systems that support life on Earth and seeing what they are and seeing how, how threatened they are. Uh, how are we doing against their limits? Are we overstepping the limits or are we working within a safe operating space? And it's now been determined that there are nine planetary boundaries, things like climate change, biosphere, uh, deforestation, fresh water, um, pollution, ocean acidification, stratosphere and, and air pollution. And we now know that six of those nine have been exceeded. Now, by definition, if we exceed one planetary boundary, say just the biosphere, so that's biodiversity loss, species loss, if we exceed, exceed that uh, limit, we endanger all life on Earth, any one of them. We endanger all, all life on Earth. And we've exceeded six of the nine, so we're not doing too well. Um, this diagram is the same as the previous one, um, and it's a little earlier, so it doesn't have the six exceeded here. But this is a, a really interesting diagram because I want to draw your attention to the black spots within that those um, within those footprints, and you see that the black spots take up most of those footprints, except for one, which is climate change, and we'll talk about that later. But those black dots refer to the impact that agriculture has on us, uh, on how those planetary boundaries have been exceeded. So you can see that agriculture alone is the biggest driver of exceeding planetary boundaries. And we'll get to why. So we now know that global food production is the single largest driver of environmental degradation and transgression of planetary boundaries. And by the way, everything that I'm quoting here is from the literature, from the peer-reviewed literature and government reports. Um, so it's it's not controversial. This is uh, peer-reviewed means that it's it's been scrutinised to a high level and it's been checked off. It's it's proven. So this is non-controversial. Um, this this is known as best our, as our systems, as our science knows. So what we do know now is that the current food system, the way we consume now, the current food system can feed half our current population sustainably. It can only feed half the number of people we have on the planet right now. So in other words, we're up against a brick wall here. This is crunch time. We can't continue. And the thesis of this talk is that diet change is essential for a habitable planet. It's no longer a matter of personal preference. I know that uh, many of us believe that we should keep our preferences to ourselves and not dictate what others should or shouldn't do, including eat. But the fact is that if we... <laughs> If we continue eating the way we are, if we continue the food systems the way they are, um, we won't have a planet for our for our grandchildren. It's as simple as that. So 
Yes, we have a population problem. As David Attenborough said, we have overrun our Earth. Um, and the population, the big problem with population is not humans, although there are nine billion of them. The big population is the animals that we keep to eat, which of which there are 90 billion each year. And the bulk of that, the bulk of the biomass, the weight of animals, is actually taken up by cattle for dairy and for um, beef. So this is a study. It's it's uh, it's about a decade old, so it's it's not up to date. But these are these are the figures from uh, a few years back. This is the weight of mammals on Earth. Okay, so that's the biomass. It's the it's the it's the weight of all the different types of mammals on Earth from from mice up to whales and elephants, cattle, etc. Humans make up a third of the biomass on Earth. Now that's enormous. It's that's true, but farmed animals make up sixty percent. Now, this is interesting because the, those farmed animals are mostly cattle. Um, about a third of it is pigs, and and a few sheep and uh, down the bottom. But the bulk of it is cattle, right? So these these animals are bred to grow as fast as they possibly can. Now, take uh, pigs, for example. Um, they normally live 15 to 20 years, but we breed them from birth to 100 kilograms, which is the slaughter weight. We breed them in five to six months, and, we, and they're bred that way so that they're ravenously hungry the whole time. They, they have to eat five times more than humans do, and, of course, they put five times more than we do. But they have to eat that because they're scaringly hungry just to put on, uh, they put on on 1.7 kilo, two pounds a day. Um, it, it's just, um, these. I feel for these poor animals. But, but the cattle are exactly the same. They've been bred to grow as fast as possible. And they make up so... So what the point here is that they make up 60% of the biomass on Earth, but what they consume is a lot more than 60% of what all the other animals consume because they're young, they're babies, they're teenagers, and they're eating like as much as they can to grow uh, because they're bred for that. So they consume more than 60% of the available food on Earth, feed on Earth. By the way, pets make up 1%. But what's left for wildlife? What do we have left for wildlife after all of that humans and, and our animals that we keep? 4%. Okay, so we've squeezed wild animals, wild mammals, into just 4% of the mammals on Earth. This is because most of it is taken up with the animals we keep for our food. So... That is the reason why we are in the midst of the sixth great extinction. We've taken all the habitat, or a lot of it, of the wildlife. So we squeeze them into a corner. This is why outbreaks happen of diseases, because uh, when you stress a wild animal, when you, when you take away its habitat, it, 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 its viral load goes through the roof. So any human contact, that viral load is more likely to jump.